I'll dive right in. I mean, I, I think the, the goal here is to give a little insight about what we're doing here at the Met. And uh, this, this particular project uh, is very interesting because it's, it's an exhibition that's live right now. Um, it's been well received and it drives right to the heart of color and sharing information and, and you know, the challenges of, that we face in cultural heritage 3D as, as technology evolves. Uh, and also at the end, uh, uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about our interest in USD, USDZ, and how we think it could all fit together. But um, I'll just begin with uh, this case study. Uh, literally, uh, what's funny is uh, this project was interesting because this artwork is trapped in its case. It could only, uh, during the whole duration of the project, all of the imaging was constrained with, with the fact that this piece could not come out of its case. So all the imaging had to happen from uh, on, on one side of the object. And uh, we started, uh, the, the goal of this project for us was to create a uh, 3D model of this object that would be used for a reconstruction um, in collaboration with uh, uh, this group of people from Germany, uh, scholars, named Vincenz Brinkmann and uh, Ulrich Brinkmann, his wife, uh, and they're known in this area of polychromy. And then uh, it was a collaboration with our science and conservation department. So uh, our first goal was to do a 3D scan just for the metrology using our Artex scanner of a plaster cast of this object, figuring that we just didn't know how we would image the actual piece uh, successfully. So that was very straightforward, up on a lift, made a scan. We had that done, and this was right before the pandemic closure. Um, our department uh, has been in active uh, continuous operations since 1906. We have 13 full-time photographers. We have a team of six post-production imaging specialists that have also self-taught into 3D primarily over the past five or six years. So uh, I think that's a, a little bit of background about our team and the scope of our operation, but our bread and butter is the 2D imaging. So I, I need to make that very clear that 3D is the afterthought in our, uh, but of course a topic of great interest. Uh, what the Met's known for is exquisite 2D photography that makes 2D images look like 3D. Uh, and I think that's important uh, when we compare and look at quality for 3D, we're comparing it to the highest quality of uh, 2D photography you'll find anywhere, uh, mainly because we have the time and to do that. And we're not commercially driven, but our mission is to convey uh, the object as it actually is. So color management, all that is very important for our work. And that lays below all of our 3D work. So in uh, November, we were able to finally get back into the museum. And so here you have Heather and Lee, uh, one of our photographers and one of our imaging specialists working on the photogrammetry capture of the front of the Sphinx. Uh, on a technical note, uh, all of our 2D imaging is scene referred. Uh, we helped develop a standard called ISO 19264. So in short, the lab values of that object are traceable to the object. Uh, one of our frustrations with 3D is there seems to be not a coherent sense of color rendition, which makes our job very difficult. Um, and uh, that first crack at this, we figured, well, we'll go for the outside and we'll merge the back of the piece from the previous scan of the plaster cast. So at this point, we didn't believe we could do the uh, accurate modeling. But what you'll see on the picture on the right is uh, we have a Canon camera on the front, but uh, we have a little DJI Osmo camera and an iPhone. And we did a quick test to see if we could build photogrammetry from um, fishing a camera, uh, a gimbal camera behind the object through the case. And uh, that test worked great. So we went ahead and created the model it, it was done uh, while well, we use uh, 3D flow and uh, MetaShape, uh, we were also using reality capture. Uh, in, in this case, the model was created in reality capture. Um, and it was surprisingly, surprisingly successful. And the nice thing about the uh, Osmo is 
you can shoot DNGs. So those were processed and color calibrated through the same uh, Lightroom workflow. So, you know, the source is uh, Lightroom to files to uh, reality capture in this case. Uh, and here is uh, Chris Hines on our team. He might be on the call uh, working on the model. And you know, it's funny when you see the camera positions, you could see uh, the, the outline of the case where those in interior pictures were taken. Uh, and I have to say, this is like uh, working around a object that's thousands of years old. You can't spray it with white powder. You know, you can't touch it. So, uh, you know, it's not nothing to do what we did. So we were just amazed that this model came out, to be honest. Uh, here's the uh, model. And you'll see the, the color fidelity is quite good. That's uh, a result of the scene referred uh, technique. And, and um, we had a very good diffuse even light um, that we pre-calibrated for. Um, so that be, because we were able to diffuse the whole display case and light it from the outside. So it made its own little light tent. Um, here's the model. That's a US. Uh, that's probably a USDZ. Let me see if I can. You ever have a problem when you would try to advance a slide after you've uh, played a video? There we go. OK, so again, the, the real ask was for us to make accurate metrology because the, the Brinkmans were creating in Frankfurt, Germany, a facsimile, a recreation. Um, and so we, we needed to, to be accurate. and. Uh, uh, when we started this project, they were looking to bring in a team from Germany to do this work. And we said, well, frankly, we would like to do this ourselves. And uh, they never saw such high fidelity uh, on a uh, scanning. So, you know, and they've been doing a lot of this in their work overseas. So we were really excited that we we hit the measurably accurate metrology and the color fidelity. And, you know, when the show's called Chroma at the Met, uh, it's, it begins with trying to be faithful. Um, so our our team played around with some AR with, uh, you know, uh, quick look and uh, playing around with, you know, just different things we could do uh, off the shelf. And, uh, you know, I was very impressed with uh, what we can do, but our big problem uh, when we get into sharing the content is all the platform wars and all the, you uh, all the ways that create interference between the public and the museum creating the content. That's a constant battle with 3D. Uh, during this project, uh, our scientists and convert conservators and the Brinkmans were visiting, and you'll see on the middle picture, you'll see uh, they brought the 3D print of the wing, which was a great moment to see the uh, 3D print coming together with the object. Uh, and you'll see Heather and Chris in the back, we were doing uh, uh, ultraviolet and infrared imaging, uh, 3D imaging tests, uh, because one of our challenges was to bring scientific findings and map them onto the 3D model. Um, and, you know, so this was a highly collaborative project. And I, I keep thinking of USD and collaboration with uh, stakeholders as a big factor of why we're interested in, uh, you know, a universal standard for interchange would be amazing. Uh, here's some uh, technology advancements in our little world. Uh, we created a and are rolling out a three-channel LED light fixture for conservators that's UV visible and infrared. And then you'll see this beautiful photogrammetry stand. If you look, if you go back to my first slide, we were trying to find like a safe way to hold the camera and using uh, existing gear, and it just wasn't really working. Um, so we worked with a uh, commercial vendor to sort of bring two concepts together, like a like a dental arm attached to something like a phoba stand. And uh, we had people here from ILM; they were drooling over our stand because for photogrammetry, it's just perfect. You can put it wherever you want safely. Um, then the uh, uh, the science findings were being translated and convert it over to the uh, reconstruction uh, in Germany. So this was an ongoing collaboration. Um, and, you know, and there, there's great debate about the exact nature of the colors. 
Um, but some of the colors are on this final object are based on um, spectral analysis and uh, all sorts of scientific findings to verify. Like they know that there's at least three or four real pigments that still exist on this piece that are agreed upon. And then there are colors that are added in from uh, scholarship from the Brinkmans and looking at other examples. So here's one of our team's meetings. You'll see Jesse, Chris, and I, and the Vincennes Brinkman, and I think that's his assistant. And, and this was their set in um, Frankfurt. So one of our challenges is the show's gonna open in, it was opening in July. And uh, I can't remember the date of this, but this piece was in Frankfurt. So we basically had to train the, the Brinkman's team on how to photograph it for photogrammetry and then transferred the data and our team built a model off of their reconstructions. Um, and, and that was very close to the show opening uh, and all of this content was to feed uh, the public facing uh, content. But we didn't see the final reconstruction until like a couple weeks before the exhibition opened. Uh, here's Deepa Paulus on our team. Uh, when we did that modeling, um, at, their images, there was no way to capture uh, or render clean the um, element there. So Deepa modeled that up. Uh, and you'll see uh, one interesting artifact of, you can see that this photogrammetry model was created from the painted object. And you can see all this surface noise and false uh, vitrology that's based on the uh, colorization that was going on on the piece. So the the photogrammetry of the original was a much higher level of uh, precision. Then um, this is where our background in color and color management came in handy. We didn't have the piece. All we had were the known colors. So we uh, pulled out our spectrophotometer, grabbed the spectral measurements from the different uh, patches that they were painting, uh, brought them to lab, and then translated them to RGB. Uh, I don't know for the life of me why no one has lab mo uh, readouts in 3D software. Uh, maybe someone can enlighten me, but um, we believe in, you know, if, if I could measure the color on the object, I, I want to see it all the way through the life of the production. But um, essentially, this is objective color. And here are the three reconstructions, the original, the interim science-based uh, reconstruction, and then the experimental reconstruction. Uh, then um, closer to the, uh, or along the way, uh, we basically started scanning other objects with our different tools. We've got a lot of tools here um, and, you know, it's constantly evolving, but, uh, you know, for these objects, uh, there were certain surfaces that indicate that paint was there. And I just want to point this out because, you know, the Faro edge arm uh, is still not enough to show the kind of detail that we need to see when we're making models, uh, whether it's a 3D reproduction or just for research to look at errors and cracks and former restorations. Uh, and I can tell you, we did a demo of the recent, um, the new Faro arms with three heads. And uh, it's still, not enough. <laughs> so, uh, but we do use the laser scanner as somewhat of a ground truth to uh, validate our photogrammetry. Um, there's also a lack of targets and standardized ways of describing what accurate metrology is. Uh, that's an area of uh, interest of, of mine as a program manager is uh, when we deliver a file, what exactly is the detail? Because people throw a lot of specs around, but you know, resolved elements versus hypothetical scanner settings. Um, now, this is where it's interesting for this group. Um, this is uh, a result of taking this um, um, this final model. We the Met has only one three D object on the website up until this show, and that one three D object was a USD that I think uh, Alexander put in the. Uh, link about the talking wood deity figure. We really don't want to go through third party platforms if we could avoid it. So this was uh, um, working in model viewer. Uh, and so we're hosting, if you go to this object page, uh, 
we're hosting a USD and a GLTF, uh, a GLB file actually. And, uh, you know, again, I find that kind of nuts, but, you know, I want to make sure we uh, carry the integrity of our work out there for people that can read USD. Uh, but I ultimately, we'd like to have one format um, that would certainly make the world a better place. Uh, and this is the model of the uh, final 3D reconstruction. And again, that was done with someone else's photographs, kind of hand holding them through the color management and everything remotely. And uh, so the museum set out to do an AR experience. It was done in Eighth Wall um, by a company called Blue Cadet. Um, and I see this as uh, successful, but I don't see why we can't do more of this in-house when 90% of the things in that application we could have done in just, you know, AR quick look if it supported um, uh, instances of the changing textures. But, uh, but of, of course, cross-platform is important. So that's an area where like the web-based USD would make this kind of thing much easier. Um, but you're welcome to look at the app and see uh, it was successful and is successful because it, it's it's working well um, and it carries a lot of information about the science, which is what we wanted to convey. But um, I think that the uh, you know the the quality of a web-based 3D leaves a lot to be desired as far as tracking and things like that. So, uh, and I hope I'm not insulting anyone. I'm just trying to be real about what I see are as limitations. Trying to get that high quality model out to the world is tricky. Oh, here's a, a bar, uh, a QR if you want to look at that. So, you know, we're pushing on all channels. Um, in, in our department, we're focused on creating the content, but we're also focused on core technology uh, and infrastructure and how to sort of spread best practice throughout the museum and also to reflect that best practice out to the community. So we're doing uh, workshops uh, with students, with interns, with uh, fellows. Uh, constantly, people are coming through the Met and sharing information so we're like a we're at least in this department becoming a pool where people can dip in and and take away what they need from it um you know we're not uh commercially driven 